So like you said, I'm Jen Strader. Uh, the best way to follow me is on Twitter. I'm code generator. I, and thank you all for coming, getting up early to come to see my talk, CodeNARC Revisited. Okay. So the slides themselves uh, should have gone out as a link via Twitter a few minutes ago. Uh, you're welcome to follow along with the slides as well as uh, these links that go to the examples that I'm going to use uh, during the presentation. Okay. So a little bit more about me. Uh, first of all, by day I am a senior consultant at a company called Object Partners. We're based out of Minneapolis, Minnesota in the United States. I, I've been there for just about a year working at the same client called PeopleNet, where we do transportation logistics, or the company itself does transportation logistics. Uh, and I've been doing various things at the different teams I've been working on there, part of which has included upgrading all of our CodeNARC uh, rules. You may also know me as the co-founder of the organization Great Ladies. If you're not familiar, Great Ladies is the organization uh, for the support of women, whether you're using, currently using Groovy Grails or a related technology, or if you're interested in learning more, we have a lot of uh, different outreach initiatives and uh, events that we host throughout uh, the world to try and get more women and other diverse groups into the Groovy community. The big announcement, if you haven't heard it yet, is that I am moving here to Denmark in August. I have a Fulbright grant, which is a U.S. State Department uh, funded program uh, where I will come here. I'm actually going, coming here for two years. The grant uh, will cover the first year. And CodeNARC is going to be a major part of that uh, in looking at status analysis, the group compiler, um, lots of interesting things that I'm excited to learn more about. So that's enough about me. I'd also like to hear a little bit about all of you. So when you're uh, creating projects that are using Groovy, how many people are using Spring Boot? Show of hands. One, two, three. a few. Um, or maybe Rat Pack. No. Grails. Okay, uh, yeah, so that's more than half. And uh, there's, of course, a lot of other options as well. Uh, is anyone using anything else in applying code nerd to it? Yes, sir. Oh, so just regular Groovy. Okay. Um, okay, so we have a, a pretty wide mix. Um, I'll try to focus more on some of the things with Grails, it seems like. Okay, so this is supposed to be a very uh, introductory uh, talk. Uh, so I'm going to start with basics. What is CodeNARC? So by definition, it's a static analysis tool for Groovy. Uh, you can use it for a variety of different things like monitoring, enforcing code standards. Uh, and if you're kind of new to the Groovy community. It's very similar to other tools in other ecosystems, things like PMD and CheckStyle. Um, however, if you have a, a project with multiple languages, CodeNARC is just for your Groovy code. So that's a very formal definition. I like to think of it as a uh, kind of like a grammar checker for when I write code. Um, and that helps me prevent a lot of simple mistakes. CodeNARC, it's also important to note that CodeNARC is not for code coverage. It's not for languages other than Groovy. And of course, it's for the Groovy uh, language as a whole. So it's not perfect at, uh, for every framework and every case that you're going to use it for. If you want to get started, uh, the website is still hosted on SourceForge. The current version is up to uh, 0.25.2, so it hasn't hit a 1.0 release. Um, it's, 
and the iterations come in spurts. It's been updated a few times this year, which is actually exciting because there weren't very many releases last year. Uh, it's fairly slow moving, but a very important tool in our ecosystem. Okay. There is a mailing list I found out very recently. Um, it was a little hard to, to find and get to, uh, but that's definitely the place to learn about what new rules are coming and any uh, advancements. If you want to try and make a pull request, it's good to uh, put it out there first uh, to talk about it. The project admin is a Charlotte based, uh, Charlotte being in the US based developer um, who mostly contributes to GitHub publicly, um, or whose GitHub contributions are mostly code narc, sorry about that. Uh, and he's definitely been the main contributor recently. Um, okay. So of course, the very basic question, why should I use CodeNARC? So it has definitely increased the readability of our code, code base. Uh, we've noticed that it saves a lot of time with code reviews. The aspect of it being a grammar checker, I find it, that my code has fewer bugs. And uh, another important one is that it's been really helpful in onboarding new team members. So there was a particular thing that kind of sped up this process. So I was going to look at CodeNARC um, after I got here. Uh, but there was a particular incident that I remember as to why I started looking at this a little more in depth at my current contract. And it was an intern. So our intern, and he was actually really awesome. But in a lot of ways, we had set him up to fail. So just like any new team member, he didn't know what our style rules were. We spent a lot of time refilling pull requests and asking him to update things that were um, small and that could be automated with CodeNARC. And there was one particular pull request um, and a few things that we read within just a few minutes that really made me question what was going on with our, our CodeNARC uh, configuration. And it started with something very simple. Um, so we noticed that he was using dot equals instead of equals equals. Um, that's okay, I can live with that, but if you're gonna make some other changes, you might as well go in and change this too. He also was a very new Groovy developer. Uh, it liked very much to use def all over the place was getting a little bit overzealous there. Uh, and especially when uh, most of the rest of our projects that we're working on use compile static, and this one in particular didn't. Um, but the def was getting a little bit out of hand. But this is the one that really, really bothered us. Um, and I'm not sure if you see it as well, um, but this really bothers us. And it's, it's little. It doesn't in any way affect um, the way that this code is going to run. But within the first three minutes that he had sent us this pull request to review, we'd found several of these things over and over again. And we honestly felt bad about it. There were... Um, it, I, it just, it wasn't good experience for him. He was frustrated and we thought there must be something better that we can do to, to help him out. But it wasn't just the intern or the new, the new guy. Um, we also had uh, some Java developers too. And some of us had come in and only known, well, not only, but uh, you've been using Groovy for a while. So it, we'd forgotten that some of the things that we do by convention within uh, Groovy aren't very intuitive uh, to someone coming out uh, from a Java background. So whether you're using G strings or, or regular strings, uh, and it's not necessarily that 
one over the other, but making it consistent, uh, mixing and matching, it's a personal style preference of mine. And the getters, uh, trying to use getters everywhere. Uh, and this is one of the things that we really noticed that the code and arc rules must be off because there's simple things like this that it just wasn't catching. The next thing that we noticed is that this company in particular has a lot of turnover. Um, sometimes as consultants were brought in to environments where uh, you get a, a lot of new people, maybe you're scaling up or turnover, et cetera. And it's really, it was really helpful in some of the style things, whether you want to use textures of spaces, how you want to configure your spaces around braces, um, things like this. And not necessarily that any of them are wrong, but some people on your team may have particular um, opinions about which one of these to use. And by setting a clear definition up front as far as what you're going to use, uh, you end up with a more consistent code base, everything's easier to read, uh, pull requests go easier, and you don't end up with these huge pull requests where someone goes back and just updates your white space um, in, in a separate PR. Every time you commit something, they immediately go in and change everything. But it's not just about new people, it's also about me. I'm sure everyone in this room has written something that was rushed, or maybe you're trying to put out a hot fix, and over time you end up with kind of a leaning tower of code, I'm gonna call it, um, stuff that might topple over at any minute um, if you don't have some checks and balances in place. So when we started looking at um, implementing our new code set rules, we noticed that they were useful for all of our interns and our new junior devs, for some of the Java devs that uh, were recently converting to Groovy, for even uh, Groovy developers who were just new to our team, and of course, for all of you and me. So there are some different approaches that you can take to start adding code narc in. The one that we started with is, uh, so in the, the year I've been there, been on four different teams, three of which were projects that were started from scratch, uh, and that gave us a really good opportunity to start with a new project, to start with just one of our teams, uh, to go through and define what we as a team uh, liked and maybe didn't liked, di didn't like. Uh, we kind of turned, turned everything on just to start, looked at what was uh, in the report and configured on a rule by rule basis what made sense for us. Went back in and fixed a lot of the things that even uh, we were doing, and once we had a set of rules that we were happy with that we'd been using for several months, we ended up uh, committing back into our, uh, our custom Gradle plugin and then went distributed out to every team uh, within our organization. But I understand that that may not work for every team. We were very lucky uh, to have that opportunity that we were starting from a fairly new project. Even if you uh, start one rule at a time, maybe whatever your development life cycle is, if you're uh, once a sprint or week or whatever, um, try to go in, in small steps. Another one is to um, start with everything on or with your rule set that you're custom to, and to set a violation limit so that um, you, know, you accept that the way that the code base is right now is flawed and that you won't go past that. Any new code that you write will no longer have violations or at least um, the sum number. 
Uh, and that's a good way to start with some older code bases as well. So you may have heard me already start talking about some keywords that uh, are fairly specific to static analysis and maybe code and arc in general. The first uh, basic building block of code and arc is a rule. So a rule is a definition of what's allowed. Uh, in this case, different things that we're going to allow in our groovy code. For example, uh, missing blank line after a package will uh, cause a violation if there's no uh, separation there. So rules are grouped into rule sets, which um, can be something like all of the formatting rules. In CodeNARC, I, they're generally grouped by these names uh, with an XML format. Uh, I'm going to mostly look at the Groovy configuration, um, but you can use XML too. So there's lots of different options for configuring rules. Things like priority, so something that's a uh, level one is something that you should fix. Um, and that those are usually what you fail your build on. Level two and three are in decreasing uh, levels of severity. And things that maybe, maybe those style, uh, style guides, things that aren't necessarily going to affect your, the, whether your code's gonna run or not, but it's nice to go back and fix them, make it easier to read. You can also customize things around the violation messages, particularly if you want to use other languages or build your own. Description, so these are things that we're going to look at when we talk about the report. As well as you can change the name of the rules. Okay. Some rules have different parameters that you can manipulate. Uh, things like how many uh, spaces if you want to, or a regex for uh, what you want variable names to look like, things like that. You can specify, this is uh, one that's particularly useful, is you can apply rules to certain classes or certain files only, and that, uh, that way if there's something custom and you're getting a lot of false positives, you can say only apply it to this type of class or file. So these are just a few. There are, of course, a lot more different configuration options that you can use. So the most common one, uh, way to add CodeNARC is the CodeNARC Gradle plugin. And it runs through a task called Dr Gradle Check. I, of course, added the link for the documentation there as well. So if, and this is where Grails kind of uh, separates. So if you are using uh, Grails 2 or earlier, there is a Grails plugin to add CodeNARC, but if you're using Grails 3, uh, you should use this Gradle CodeNARC, or yeah, Gradle CodeNARC plugin. Okay. So within our configuration uh, for the Gradle plugin, we have different options like where to put the config file, whether or not we want to ignore failures, so this is, and as well as the number of uh, violations. So this is where if you have an old uh, code base and you want to kind of just set a bar and not go above it, uh, you can add all of those different configuration options. Alternatively, you can also change the report format. By default, it's HTML, but uh, particularly when we use it with Jenkins, uh, you may want it as an XML so that it can hook into uh, custom Jenkins plugins and the like, um, as well as tool version if you want to upgrade or keep it a particular version of CodeNARC. So this is what it looks like when I add it to uh, any of my example apps, the 
tool version is specified. Uh, and this is a, a interesting thing. That, so I separate out, and we have a different configuration for our regular source code as we do for our tests. And I'll talk a little bit about why I um, do it that way. But uh, you definitely can, and I, I suggest it. To get started, uh, they do publish a list of all of the rules out uh, as a giant text file. And so like I said, you can also use XML, but I like the groovy version. Uh, there's also a properties file, but why not use groovy? You can do a lot of cool things, particularly when you're customizing parameters and uh, what you want to apply the different rules to. So this is a, a big giant list of all of the possible rules separated by type, and you can turn them off individually or as a group um, just by commenting them out, as well as by uh, draw, uh, adding it as a parameter to do enabled false. So that's if you want to completely ignore it from your entire code base or, or tests. Maybe you have a rule that's turned on that um, you want to apply in general, but this is a one particular case that you really need to do something different. So say duplicate string literal because you're, uh, that's a common one. You can suppress it at the level of the class or at the level of the method uh, and tell which rules you want to turn off for that particular set. I wondered whether I should include this at all because it's very dangerous. Uh, you only want to do this when it's absolutely necessary. If you notice that you're using suppress warnings all over the place, you may want to consider turning that rule off globally. Suppress warnings should be the exception, not the rule. So now that we've gone over some of the basics, what the terms mean, maybe the other part uh, that I had proposed is maybe you haven't updated CodeNARC in a while. So what we had found when I went to uh, look back at our config, see why our, our intern was checking in code that uh, had all of these issues, notice that we hadn't updated CodeNARC in almost 10 versions. We were missing a lot of the rules. and um, I'd always kind of taken it for granted in other projects because someone else had done the work of maintaining CodeNARC and updating all the rules. Um, the more people I started talking to about this, uh, the more that I got, well, maybe we haven't looked at it in a while. So there are some actually interesting things that have happened in the last several versions that I wanted to talk about and maybe that you might want to know about as well. So I'm going to start uh, about a year, year and a half ago with the 2.1 series. So a lot of these were related to formatting, uh, things like no wildcard imports, uh, whether or not to use blank lines uh, or fail on that, uh, as well as one that came back to bite me uh, called file ends without a new line. Uh, okay. In point two two, uh, there was a very interesting one called no def, um, which means that you should type everything uh, and not use defs all over the place. As well as an interesting one that I thought uh, or thought was interesting for safe navigation. Uh, so. Adding the, the null safe on a big uh, long example, you may not necessarily need it. Uh, and so you can reduce some overhead by not having all of those extra null safes if you don't need them. Uh, so you can actually get some interesting uh, enhancements there as well. Uh, so when I had first submitted my uh, proposal to 
start studying code and arc. I had originally thought, oh, well, why don't I look at how loops work? Found out in point two three that they have done some of the work that I had uh, already wanted. Uh, so there's some, some interesting things about nesting for loops so that you don't end up with crazily inefficient code. So there is some, still some work that I can contribute to this in the future, hopefully, um, but that's a good one just to get started. So I went uh, 0.23 to 0.25 uh, is the most recent. So if you are a fan of tabs, it seems you are in a losing battle because um, now it is officially part of the, the CodeNARC suggested rules. As well as uh, an interesting one for trailing commas, so especially if you've got some uh, long maps and you don't really need a comma at the end. Um, I don't know, it looks cleaner just to not have that. And it, so these are about all of the different new rules that have been added in these different versions. Each release also improves existing rules. So maybe um, going inch by inch, if you have somewhere where you've suppressed warnings for a particular rule in several places, you could go back and look and see if that has been updated. Maybe the thing that you were getting false positives before has now been fixed in a more recent version. Uh, as well as, I mean, improvements to run a little faster and uh, in general just match better for several of these rules. So the uh, next part is hopefully a little bit more of a discussion than me just telling you. But here are some important things that I have found uh, in upgrading, and I definitely am not an expert on all of the rules yet. Uh, but here are some ones that stuck out, stuck out as we were trying to do all of our upgrades. So the first one was file ends without new line. So this may not seem like a, a big deal unless you've run into issues with cross-platform uh, issues between Windows and Macs and trying to get everything in GitHub. Uh, so that was the first reason that I encountered it. Even um, before I started using Groovy, I knew that having the, a standardized way of doing new lines at the end was important. What I hadn't expected um, was that the way that our, our complicated build system works, we um, I didn't have a new line at the end of my Gradle properties file, and we had another system that was trying to read that in and, and analyze it and do a bunch of different things. And it took us a long time to try and figure out why our build was failing. It doesn't make sense, doesn't make sense. And it couldn't parse because it was looking for that new line at the end of the file. Uh, and ended up blowing things up. So there are reasons if you're, do, if you're analyzing your code outside of the, the system that having a new line may be very important. And the next thing is that I don't necessarily like all of them. So the, here are a few that we turned off very early in the process. And the first one is not just a rule, but an entire set. So the dry rules are, there are some, some pluses and minuses to doing that. Uh, we ran into a lot of issues with, uh, with duplicates, and we just got pos uh, false positives all over the place. When we were adding so many suppressed warnings, it, that was when we really considered just turning off the entire set. The next one is could be Elvis, and that actually um, was created by some of my friends in Minnesota, so I uh, know that they're not happy that I'm not using their rule. But we found that it has a lot of false positives in um, things that weren't really uh, eligible to be used as, so it's the if, this, then, the same thing. And it was catching, catching too much. 
It's also, uh, we'd also turned off the entire J unit rule set because it was really having trouble with, because we write SPAC tests. This was a new project we got to pick. And they were really butting up against each other, uh, having issues trying to detect what was there. And of course, all of these ones that I um, have issues with, I uh, would like to go in, back in and contribute back to making some of these better. So no def is one that can be good, but can also be bad. So it was very beneficial for our Spring Boot app where we're um, using most of the conventions, nothing really um, exceptional. But I also have some side projects that I do with Grails. And the nodef rule is really bad for Grails because things, particularly if you think about like the controllers, um, it's one of those ones that you may want to do on a, on a project by project basis rather than uh, having it as a rule for everything. There were a few that I thought were, sounded really good in the documentation. I'm like, oh yeah, this sounds really good. I um, want to make my code groovier and not use return statements because you don't need them, they're optional. But I didn't realize how much it improves readability. When I'm scanning through a, a large file and I'm really trying to figure out what this method returns, um, I ended up turning this one off because I wanted those return statements. It actually made it easier. Having the rule on made it harder to read than, than being beneficial. So line length is one of the reasons why we have two separate code and arc files. So in source code, we definitely want a, a line length limit. It makes everything easier to, to read when it's within a certain set. But there are exceptions, particularly within Spock. So within labels, uh, the one that was like, the one thing that we noticed in particular was where blocks. Um, you have a big giant table, and we ended up doing that so much that we turned it off in the test, but we keep it on, definitely keep it on within our source code. So these are a few that maybe we could talk about. You may not agree with me, but in general, I like consistency. So unnecessary groovy string is uh, no longer uh, extra overhead to, to have it as a, a G string or as a regular string. You can get conversion or, an every, or a coercion. But it looks more consistent, at least to me, to have it um, have this rule on so that you don't get, uh, within even a, a block of, of strings or config, you can end up with singles and doubles and singles and doubles. Um, as well as unnecessary getters. So there are a few reasons or a few places where we have uh, getter turned off. Maybe the method makes more sense if you have a getter. But in general, I have that one uh, turned on. Okay. So there are some ones that don't really affect performance, but also affect readability as well. So things that are my personal preferences, but that aren't supported necessarily by IntelliJ out of the box. So misordered static imports is one. Maybe it's just the way that I first started learning that we had ours at the top. You could also configure it to have your static imports at the bottom. Um, the important thing about this rule, though, is that you don't mix and match them. It's much easier to read if you have a block of static imports and a block of, of regular imports. Um, that's important part there. The other one that I've definitely debated among different teams is whether or not to use wildcard imports. So uh, 
I like to see exactly what's being imported, particularly when you could get, can get conflicts between different packages and different names. Uh, but with IntelliJ in particular, if you have this on, um, I use a feature to copy uh, if it's something that's going to be kind of similar or just to, to get the setup of a, a file. Uh, and IntelliJ adds wildcard imports when you do a copy, so be careful with that one. And there is a set of rules that I'm still not sure how I feel about them. And those are complexity metrics. I've seen it be really helpful in a few cases, um, but it's a little bit annoying for me too. We had the one case where it was really helpful um, is that we had a really large test suite and people just kept adding new tests, new tests, new tests. And eventually we ended up hitting the, the limit. And someone said, hey, can I turn this off? And I'm like, well, how many methods do you have in this, uh, this test suite? Or just, just in a particular spec, 70 something? Why don't you refactor that? <laughs> um, so in that case, it was actually pretty helpful. But it can also be a little bit picky, particularly with the um, complexity of, of what's within a, a method. Um, and it, it takes me a little longer to, to go back and refactor those. So maybe in the future, I'll turn some of those off. But for now, we have them turned on. There's also a bit of warning. Um, so I wrote a blog post about this. It didn't get very much visibility, so I'm not sure um, if any of you have seen it. But in the uh, in CodeNark, there is a new rule set, the enhanced rule set, and it does some kind of complex analysis, and it doesn't work in every system. So the Gradle CodeNark or the Gradle CodeNark plugin in particular it doesn't support these rule sets unless you have um, some special configuration, and we didn't. And the error message was not very intuitive. Um, it was giving an error that it couldn't compile a bunch of classes, but it still passed. Um, so that's a, a word of caution. If you were using the Grails plugin, the older for older versions of Grails, that one does support it. Uh, and this is it's on the uh, the roadmap to get this fixed in the the Gradle plugin. But of course, like everything else, uh, they need more contributors. So. Hopefully that will get be resolved soon. So now that we've talked about all of the different ways that you can configure rules, it's also useful to talk about what it looks like when something fails and maybe whether or not you should fix it. So by default, the format is HTML. It looks pretty intuitive. Um, Color-coded, you get different messages about what or isn't failing. And you can also hook into particular uh, things like Jenkins and get a similar report that way. So you get a list of pr these different priorities, things that are essential, things that are not so much. So I, I made some formatting changes to this file, ended up with a couple of priority three violations, things that don't really matter, but I want them fixed. The next thing that probably gonna come up now that you have your rules configured, you know what tests or what violations are passing and failing, is how to create a custom rule. Maybe there's something that you do on your team that isn't covered or isn't configurable in the standard rule set. And this um, is definitely something that I need to take a deeper look at because it gets a little bit more complex on how this is actually analyzing. So I pulled this from the documentation for CodeNARC and uh, you're extending uh, some ab an abstract rule and setting the name, the priority. And you can make them very simple, things that analyze a file as a whole. Uh, a good example of that one is uh, the check for consecutive blank lines. That's a good example to, to get started. Uh, 
and I, I definitely have looked at trying to create new custom rules and try and contribute them back uh, within our, our organization. Okay. So it's also important to contribute back. So once you have your custom rule, maybe it's something that um, you think other people might be able to use as well. So you can, uh, and this is one thing that I really actually liked about CodeNARC is that uh, contributing back is very well documented. And there is a, a command line prompt that will go in and generate a bunch of the, the code and documentation for you. Uh, and then you just have to write that little block to apply the rule. Um, so it is, and it's all on GitHub. Um, the documentation is on Sourceforge, but you can contribute back via, via GitHub. So this is, these are just a few of the things that I wanted to talk about with CodeNARC. You can read the documentation uh, to learn about each rule specifically. So I just went over a few of the ones that we thought were particularly interesting. There's a way you can do it with Ant, as well as uh, there's several command line prompt options if you don't want to run it as part of your build as a whole. So I have two different example rule sets that uh, have been spread around a little bit. Uh, I know that Sergio has uh, provided the link to my Grails one in, in Groovy Calamari. Uh, and these are, these are what I use. These are just starting points. You'll, of course, want to configure what you use individually um, by project or, or as a whole. And I um, have published a different one for Spring Boot. So like I said, each framework is slightly different, is what you do. Um, and th the Spring Boot one as well has an example of how to in comment it out, how to add a, a custom rule to your rule set. So in conclusion, CodeNARC is a great tool. It's an important, very important part of our ecosystem. It was very helpful for helping um, our younger devs learn about different, learn about Groovy, as well as our team's style preferences, uh, as well as detecting some simple inefficiencies, things around uh, loops, et cetera. It was pretty easy to add, especially to get started with the Gradle plugin. And you can, of course, create your own rules, and hopefully you will contribute them back. That concludes uh, this part of the presentation. So what questions do you have? Yes. Um, do you know anything about integration sonar? I haven't. OK, so the, the question is, is there an integration for sonar? And I am not a, um, familiar with it. I know that I think that there is in the documentation. It looks familiar, but I haven't used it personally. Um, I, but I believe it's in the documentation. Right, right. That's where it looks familiar. So the um, in the back, the answer uh, was that it CodeNARC is part of the Groovy Sonar plugin. That's correct. Yes. Yes, in the back. Um, have you used the IntelliJ plugin with the Spring Boot work? I feel like I think I have that one turned on. Um, it's a very good question. I think I remember there's a few things that it doesn't catch. There is also a plugin for CodeNARC um, with Eclipse as well, I believe. But um, yeah, I, I haven't I haven't seen any any issues with it. So. I was curious because I used to use it with IntelliJ at some point. It was like working. Oh. I didn't know if like, it was working at Ant. Okay, so I should definitely write that down and take a look and make sure that um, that's working or I can see if I can get it working again. Okay, oh, and I think I forgot to repeat the question was whether or not um, 
there is an IntelliJ plugin for CodeNARC and whether it is working again. So. Does anyone have uh, particular rules that they may disagree with me on? So. Tabs. Tabs. <laughs> yes. Um, and that's, yeah, so just, it, I mean, as long as it's consistent, um, enforce it within the, the whole team. I guess I will end the awkward silence and stop here. Thank you all. <laughs>